The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, a behind the scenes look at the women reshaping Congress. The 50th anniversary of Earth Day in the midst of a pandemic, plus Bill Press on how the media should cover Trump during a public health crisis. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Jennifer Steinhauer's newest book takes a deep dive into the 116th Congress through the lens of the record-setting number of women newly elected to office. She says the diversity they bring goes far beyond gender. And we say hello to Jennifer Steinhauer, reporter for The New York Times, who has covered the United States Congress since February of 2010. She's also the author of The Firsts, the inside story of the women reshaping Congress. Jennifer Steinhauer, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure to have you with us. This is a book about the 35 women newly elected members in Congress in 2018 and the most diverse Congress in our nation's history. For many of them, being a woman is not the only way they are a first. In what other ways are they groundbreakers? Well, this Congress has a number of groundbreakers among the women. You have your first two Muslim um, women in Congress. You have your two first Native American women. Um, Then you have some first for states, like two first Latino women in Texas. You have um, many places where you have the first woman or the uh, first um, person of color from that particular district, um, the youngest, the oldest (laughs) female to ever serve in the house. Um, In Lauren Underwood, who is from the Chicago suburbs, you have the first woman, the youngest person, and the first person of color to serve in that district. So there's a lot of firsts going on. And there are a lot of people. How did you research on this book? Well, you know, really, it was just about spending time with folks. I mean, uh, when my editor uh, from Algonquin called me and said she had a big interest in these firsts, um, I said, great, let's do it. And I started right after a freshman orientation in November 2018, after they won the midterm elections, kind of following people around. And some people were going to be of obvious interest, like AOC, who had just you know surprised everybody by winning this Democratic primary. Um, but then I was looking for women whose stories, um, who may not be at that point, national names, some became so a little bit, some haven't so much, but who might be of interest and whose stories would be interesting. And there were just so many of them because the women come from a diverse background, um, ethnically, racially, but also professionally. You have women who served in the military, um, and, and other national security positions. You have women from all over the country, from rural areas, from urban areas. So, um, some of them with, you know, a lot of private sector experience, I mean, just highly qualified. Some of them, if you look at Donna Shalala, who I alluded to earlier, the oldest um, female member to serve in the House, she was obviously a cabinet secretary in the Clinton administration, had been the president of university, not someone you would expect to be as a freshman member in the House of Representatives. She knows probably more people in the leadership office than uh, all the other freshmen combined. But that's just the kind of Um, interesting uh, diversity that you see in this house. And all but one of the women you followed are Democrats. In fact, you note that the number of Republican women actually dropped. How did you come to understand why there is such a difference? Well, at first I thought, you know, wow, Republican women have had a bad year. And and generally speaking, um, that's been the case in the house. But I was really surprised when I started to research the book to realize that Republican women have been sliding um, elected office, particularly in the House, but beyond for the last decade. And there are a lot of reasons. I have an entire chapter in my book just about Republican women, even though the story really is about 
the 116th Congress and the women of this House, and that's obviously principally talking about Democrats who are also in charge. But I, I thought it was worth taking a chapter and look at Republican women because Republican and Democrats, um, as far as women go, historically, the first woman in Congress in the House actually was a Republican. And if you look at the history of women in Congress, it kind of was pretty equal in number for many, many years in the beginning. And so there have been a lot of um, political and structural changes that have happened uh, in our political culture that have caused that reduction. And it's really quite striking. Mm -hmm. And I, which I think it's fair to say equal, but they were still very, very small in number. Republican women prior to this year, you mean? In, in the earlier days, right. Well, in the earlier days, you know, you only had a handful of women at any given time, you know, one, two, three at any time. Yeah. Sometimes it was Republican. Sometimes it was a Democrat and a Republican. I mean, it was kind of even actually until about the 1970s. And even mm -hmm. then you had a lot of um, Republican women um, serving and they worked with Democrat women to form the Republican women's, the, um, rather the women's caucus in the House because it was kind of the only way that they could have power because women just didn't have gavels and they didn't even have big roles on, on big committees back in the day. So they worked in a more bipartisan way than they do now to advance certain um, policy agendas that they agreed upon because that was kind of, that was their only sort of leverage of power. Mm. Now, just beginning with the workplace, how much ground had been laid by the women before them in building a workplace that could accommodate and welcome them? Well, the Capitol is kind of a strange workplace to begin with, and um, the sort of gendered nature of that has been true since the beginning. I mean, there are great stories, some of which I recount in my book about women just trying to get a gym that was equal um, to the men's in, in, in the 70s, in the 1970s, as we were looking at um, Title IX, as we were looking at all kinds of legislation to advance uh, women in the workplace and in education. Women were still fighting for basically like a gym. And even in the 90s, um, women uh, weren't senators, weren't allowed to use the pool. And they tried to figure out why that was because of course some of them wanted to and they found out because some of the male senators were swimming in the nude. And that's pretty recently. Um, it wasn't until 2011 um, that women even had a bathroom, a ladies room off the floor of the house where men already had facilities. They had to walk halfway you know, down into the, through the rotunda. So this has really been a work in progress and it's been pretty slow. And when you think about it, women don't still don't quite make up a quarter of the Congress. So you can kind of see where this has been. It's amazing to think that this is 2020 and we're having this conversation. Um, one of the questions that drives this book is what will be different because of these women? Of course, it's going to take time to answer that question, but we've got to start somewhere. For one thing, they represent constituencies who have not traditionally had a big voice on the Hill. What difference has that made? I think it's been an interesting difference. Um, I don't think the kind of provisional conclusion that I came to was that until you have a large number of women, at least half, it's hard to necessarily say that women um, make a difference by being the majority as per se as women. But I do think having a more diverse Congress has made a difference. I think that, and, and it's pushed by women, a lot of these agendas like having a black maternal caucus um, focusing on the very uh, tragic issue of the high rates of, of um, African-American maternal death in this country, uh, I think would not have been advanced if you didn't have a necessarily a black women in the house now leading that cause. And they've been joined by others, but they were really the force behind that. I think if you look at Deb Holland from New Mexico, one of the two new Native American women, she's really focused on tribal issues. It's not as if that um, has not been an issue in Congress for a long time, but she just really was elevating that. And you know, it really makes a difference when um, Native Americans come to the Hill and they are meeting with someone who already kind of knows their, their issues, their community, who's um, fluent in the language of, um, of, that, of policies that impact them. So that definitely, that, that definitely does have an impact. You also write that they have reframed the debate over some very big issues. Can you give us some examples? Well, in that sense, I think what I was referring to there to some degree had to do with the policy disputes that you see within the Democratic Party um, where certain things have been taken for granted and certain positions have not been challenged as much. And what happened is just like you're seeing um, now in the primary race for the White House among Democrats, you saw kind of play out, uh, presage that if you will, 
in the 116th Congress between the more progressive wing of the party and the more moderate wing, many of whom, um, many of it was made up by women and some men, principally women, who defeated Republican incumbents in 2018 and returned that House to the Democrats. So they kind of um, have felt like they need to, to continue to, to be able to attract voters who are more moderate Democrats, independents, even Republicans, obviously, who help them win their seat. But nonetheless, having progressives um, like um, um, AOC and others bringing up issues, really pushing the envelope on climate change where Democrats had been more quiet after kind of getting clobbered over cap and trade earlier, uh, you know, 10 years ago, um, talking about money in politics and truly kind of pushing the issue of not having super PACs and certain types of money in politics. I really do credit this class um, with, with pushing those issues more to the forefront and, and putting pressure on fellow Democrats. We're speaking with Jennifer Steinhauer, reporter for The New York Times and author of The Firsts, The Inside Story of the Women Reshaping Congress. Jennifer, an issue none of them may have anticipated is impeachment. What was the influence of these women on the way impeachment was talked about inside and outside of Congress? Yeah, I wouldn't say they didn't anticipate it in the sense that you may recall that um, right the day they were sworn in, Rashida Tlaib, who's one of the new progressive women from um, Michigan, made a lot of news when she went to an event after that evening, I think it was a moveon.org event, and talked about openly about impeaching uh, President Trump. And it really kind of rattled the party because they didn't want to start off on that foot. But the progressive end, um, progressive women, and a few men too, obviously, uh, were kind of pushing the idea of doing that for a long time. And Nancy Pelosi, House Speaker, was poo-pooing it and trying to stay away from that. Now, when the Ukraine issue bubbled to the surface, the women, and there were some men as well, but the, uh, principally women um, who had worked in the national security space, who I tend to think of as more of the squad than the squad in the sense that they're in constant communication, group texting, they tend to vote together, they work together on a lot of things. They decided that that was really beyond the pale and even though they had not been excited about impeaching the president because it wasn't popular in a lot of their districts, they felt um, with their national security background that this this was a different type of issue and they should uh, probably move forward and wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post, which is extremely influential on the debate, certainly was influential on their Democratic um, colleagues, and I think really uh, did move the needle, um, not uh, by themselves, but surely were instrumental in moving the needle for Nancy Pelosi's decision to go ahead and, and proceed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because she really did not want to do that, uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi. That, that was kind of the last thing she really wanted to do. And, um, and she really didn't, because as I said, you know, this. if you think about the fact that there were so many Democrats who had won districts that had been held by Republicans, um, where President Trump was not necessarily as unpopular. In a lot of those places, you know, Trump was not necessarily as unpopular as Republican members of Congress. So they wanted to tread lightly around that. And I think, you know, House Democrats really ran on health care in 2018, you know, in response to Republicans trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act and um, and on affordable drug prices and things like that. Um, and they they didn't so much want to focus on, on him. Uh, you know, they wanted to get right. to 2018 and then resurface those issues in 2020. So... Yeah, that wasn't too terribly attractive to her and a lot of members. But, you know, we saw we saw what happened. We saw how it played out. And, and, and we'll see in the long term what impact it has. It's kind of hard to contextualize it right now because of everything going on with the COVID-19 story. Right. It's it's a little fluid right now in a lot of different ways. Um, Jennifer, with some of these women getting so much attention, such as Ilhan Omar and uh, AOC Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Others are getting much less, as you pointed out. Who are some of the first we should know more about? Well, I mentioned Lauren Underwood before. I think she's really interesting. She's really um, puts her head down and does a lot of legislation. Uh, I think um, Mikey Sherrill, uh, who is, from the, has a, is a veteran, mother of four, really interesting member from New Jersey. Um, I would say th- those are a couple, a couple folks. Um, you know, she kind of came into the spotlight during the immigration debate, but I'm not sure people know a lot about Veronica Escobar. She took Beto O'Rourke's seat uh, at the border in Texas, uh, and she replaced Katie Hill, who you may remember resigned before her first year was even up in a scandal um, involving uh, uh, some campaign and uh, possible staffers and her relationship with them. And Veronica Escobar replaced her as a leader in the freshman class. 
she's really someone to watch too, I think, in, in, in the Democratic Party. Now, of course, being first inevitably means making mistakes. What kind of mistakes have you observed? Well, you know, anytime you go into a new workplace, and especially one as sprawling and complicated, and in many ways arcane as the U.S. Congress, you're going to make sort of just basic mistakes about understanding legislative process and so forth. I mean, sure. I don't know if you would call it a mistake, but I would say that there's been corrective action in the way um, AOC approached her job politically. She uh, obviously beat Joe Crawley, who was you know, in line to be speaker one day, this uh, very entrenched Democratic incumbent from New York, and was very excited uh, with the popularity that she showed for having a, a, you know, in the progressive end of the party and pushing progressive politics. And she kind of stormed in and uh, frequently made a point that she was going to help lead primary challenges against some of her, her colleagues and even endorsed, had been endorsing um, candidates against her colleagues, uh, particularly in the uh, Congressional Black Caucus and so forth, and her staff would sort of attack them. I noticed this go around in 2020. She's been very reluctant to do that. She's endorsed very few challengers to the incumbents, and the two that she has were kind of uh, against Democrats who were not particularly popular um, in their conference anyway. So she she's really learned, I think, that that didn't make her popular. And, you know, Congress, like every other workplace, is based on relationships. It was hard to get things done legislatively and get people to work with you when they think, you know, you're going to stab them in the back and try and push them out of office. And I think it's been really interesting watching that because I kind of have wondered if um, Ocasio-Cortez was more interested in sort of taking Bernie Sanders' mantle, if you will, and being more of a, a political figure than, than a, um, a legislative one. And that really showed me, at least in the short term, that she is very much interested in staying in Congress, at least for now, it would seem, and working within that institution um, and trying to advance. And you know, she reminds me a lot of women that I read about in the 1970s, like Shirley Chisholm, who started off um, more combative with colleagues and ended up forming really strong relationships, even across the aisle, um, to become real legislative forces and real national figures. So I just keep an eye on her and, and see how she evolves. Mm -hmm. Now, another question you ask in the book is, will Congress change them? Are you ready to answer that? Well, that example I just gave you in some ways, I think, shows that. I mean, look, the thing about it is most people who win elections, not all, but the vast majority, they like it and they want to stay. They want to stay in office. And so they will make compromises, um, political compromises, uh, sometimes doing things uh, that are playing their district that may not play well uh, with, with their colleagues and so forth you know, with the idea of staying elected. Um, there are uh, demands, increasing demands on you from people that you raise money from. Um, even when it is small donors, they have expectations in you. So, um, and sometimes just the rigors of it all wear people down. So I'm not ready to make that verdict because, you know, the 116th Congress is not even over. But I think um, Washington almost always has the advantage in these in this sort of existential battle. And that uh, and that just kind of remains to be seen. That's sort of the question I had with a Tea Party class, frankly, that came in in 2011 in the Tea Party wave when Republicans took back the gavel in the House. And uh, for some of them, it was obviously advantage Washington. Um, some of many of them are now gone, um, but some of them kind of st stuck to the way they are. And we see where they are now when we look at Mark Meadows. Uh, who's now, um, you know, incoming chief of staff to, the, to President Trump. Obviously, an unusual administration probably wouldn't have had that job in any other administration. But you see you see um, how people's careers evolve here. And it's, it's really pretty fascinating in a short amount of time sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. It seems to be moving a lot faster nowadays than I ever remember it from years past. But Yeah, well, certainly I look at those that class of uh, 2011, as I said, those Republicans, and I looked up a few years later and some of them for a variety of circumstances were senators all, all of a sudden. I mean, so it, it definitely um, it definitely life can come at you fast in Washington. Yeah, no doubt about it. Now, you covered Congress for a long time before you embarked on this book. Did writing the book change any of your ideas about Congress? Um, I actually think in a weird way, it taught me more about Congress. I've certainly learned about more hallways and byways than I knew about before, clocking four or five miles a day, which is walking around. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that I, it really made me have to understand process more because process what was sometimes kind of um, a difficult hurdle for some of the members. And so I had to really try to put myself in their head of what they were going through. 
Um, you know, I also think it was kind of humbling in a very good way because as you're a reporter for a, um, a, a national news organization, um, that's sometimes helpful, sometimes not helpful, but often it, you know, it means that people will talk to you right away about the issues that matter to them. When you're writing a book, sometimes you can be a low priority. And so it really caused me to have to scramble in some cases and chase people around a lot and really spend a lot of time trying to get in with them. And, you know, that was ultimately a good experience. Um, And I think I learned more having to do that work. Hmm. That's an interesting thing that I wouldn't have thought that would have happened that way. I would, would think that you already, you know, have some form of relationship with folks. You're a reporter for the New York Times. And just because you're writing a book, that would sort of get you an in, but not so much, huh? Well, they were all new, too. So they didn't necessarily ah. know me or um, have any affinity for my necessarily for my news organization. Uh, now, I write a lot about veteran affairs now. I focus a lot on that. So I would say I got to know some of that group of women a little earlier, a little deeper because I was writing stories about them. Um, So that did make a difference. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Jennifer Steinhauer, reporter for the New York Times, author of the first, the inside story of the women reshaping Congress. Jennifer joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you so much for your time with us today, Jennifer. And we look forward to having you back again with us soon. I appreciate it, and I'd like to let your listeners know you can still get books on IndieBound. Uh, you know, a lot of the independent bookstores are delivering through there um, and, and on Amazon. Thanks for your time. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, the coronavirus pandemic is forcing activists from the street to the screen. What will that mean for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day? We'll find out in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his Common Sense Commentary. Glorious news, people. The renowned professor of pandemicology, Dr. Donald Trump, has found the magical antidote to coronavirus that had eluded lesser scientists. It's the Peter Cottontail solution. While sitting in the Rose Garden, the resident White House pandemicologist said that it suddenly dawned on him that hippity-hoppity Easter's on its way. So he declared that he was ready to lift all those pesky health restrictions and, quote, have the country opened up by Easter. Would our public health crisis be over by then? Dr. Trump said he didn't worry about such factual details. Instead, he explained to a television audience that, quote, I just thought it was a beautiful time noting that all of the nation's churches could be packed on that Sunday, bringing people together in celebration of his miraculous rising of the moribund economy. But wouldn't such a holy mass gathering actually reinvigorate the diabolical COVID-19 pathogen, spreading its destruction further, deeper, and longer? Sure, said the good doctor, you are going to lose a number of people. But Wall Street and corporate America are crippled by employees staying home, so, quote, we have to get back to work. His rallying cry for workers to pump up the sagging stock market echoes a crass die-for-the-Dow ethic espoused by Wall Street barons and billionaires. 
This is Jim Hightower saying, of course, for the cold inhumanity of such a dreadful policy idea to be made clear, it needs to be officially embraced as Texas stupid. Sure enough, one of my state's right-wing politicos, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, lunged into the national spotlight to one-up Trump, saying that returning America to full economic throttle pronto is worth sacrificing the lives of grandparents who are 70-plus years old. Let's be smart about it, he blathered, demonstrating to millions that he and this idea are dumber than a dust bunny. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. 50 years ago, 20 million Americans turned out for the very first Earth Day. Because of the pandemic, that anniversary will be celebrated online. Kathleen Rogers is leading the campaign, and she says the message of Earth Day is essential now more than ever. And we say hello to Kathleen Rogers, president of the Earth Day Network, where their mission is to diversify, educate, and activate the environmental movement worldwide. Kathleen Rogers, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure to speak with you. Um, not everyone in our audience is old enough to remember the first Earth Day. I am, but I'm not the audience. So if you could, why don't you start out by reminding us of the state of the environmental movement when Earth Day first happened? It's a great question, and I think we have to think about that uh, as we move through the 50th anniversary and look at the climate issues that face us now along with biodiversity decline and other issues. But back then... We had been through about 150 years of industrial development, and we had, not just in our country, but in developed countries, we had enormous uh, consequences of fossil fuel production and development, and you couldn't see across the street in Los Angeles during rush hour, terrible air pollution everywhere with asthma rates skyrocketing because of toxic dumps and other types of pollutants. We were seeing big centers of uh, child um, issues and birth defects. Uh, We had, of course, the Cuyahoga River on fire, oil spills, and a decline in many, many species, including the most famous one, which of course is our bald eagle, the result of a lack or failure uh, on government's part to regulate the use of DDT, uh, among other chemicals. And so you had a a state of enormous decline in terms of health, environment, deforestation, species, uh, extinction. And the time was ripe for a movement, not just because the state of the environment was so obvious to people, um, wherever you were, except in even the most remote areas. And already you had acid rain killing wildlife and fish in, in lakes. And so the obviousness of the issue made it easy, uh, but there was a second movement and set of issues going on at the same time, and those were the anti-war movements, the civil rights movement, and across the country there was, I think, the stirring of a rebuke to the way things were, and so Earth Day coming at that time was a combination of the fervor that people felt, not just young people, not just students, uh, but the interest and concern they had about a wide variety of issues. And the thing about the environment is uh, it's, number one, the definition is what surrounds you. So everyone was experiencing it. It wasn't remote. It wasn't Vietnam. It wasn't some other place. It was in your neighborhood, your streams, your water. And so you had a general sense that we needed to do something about it. And of course, maybe five or six years before Rachel Carson had come out with her famous, famous book, Silent Spring, about DDT. And so I think the resistance to change was just not present the way it was even in those other movements, civil rights and the war, where you had steadfast interests fighting against what was right. 
And so when Gaylord Nelson came up with an idea to do an environmental teach-in and Dennis Hayes, working with him, came up with the concept for a much broader thing called Earth Day, the interest of the American public just skyrocketed and they turned out 20 million people on the streets. And that was a little bit more than 10% of our entire population in a single day. And I believe it remains the largest civic event in human history, 20 million people coming out in the streets for a single issue. And even the media was almost reverential. I've seen some of the tapes from back then, Walter Cronkite in particular, where he stunned, and lots of other networks, there were only a couple at the time, but newspapers were stunned by the number of people out in the streets. And I think it was a combination of the people out in the streets, uh, the fact that environment impacted everybody, uh, it was what surrounded you, and because at the time, it's hard to believe now, we had a uh, bipartisan Congress working together on lots of issues. And so the net result of that first Earth Day, besides shock and awe, uh, was that the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, and the Congress worked together to pass in rapid succession some of our greatest environmental laws. And interestingly, uh, one of my favorite laws, I call it the mother of all laws, was actually passed and signed by Richard Nixon, passed by Congress and signed by Richard Nixon before Earth Day in January. It's called NEPA, the National Environmental Policy <clears throat> Act, now under attack uh, by the current administration. But it, it's a fabulous law that provides all of us, me, you, and every listener, the right to information about what's going on in your community, community right to know laws, and the right to sue your government if you don't, if they don't enforce the laws. These are powerful tools that each of us have. After the first Earth Day, after Congress passed a succession of environmental laws, including uh, clean air, clean water, it was a revision of clean water. In addition to that, it included the Endangered Species Act and another of critically important laws. The group of people who included Dennis Hayes and most of the other young people that were the backbone and staff of the first Earth Day, they came together again and began to focus politically on a dozen people who they felt had blocked or attempted to block some of the best laws that had been passed by Congress. So the November after Earth Day, they targeted a group of people, a dozen altogether, now called the Dirty Dozen, and 10 of them were especially targeted, and out of the 12, they defeated seven. So suddenly, Dennis Hayes and the environmental movement became a political force, and then everything changed almost immediately overnight. And the environmental community began to experience what I look back on fondly as a honeymoon period, where they worked with Congress and states and the administration. Republican and Democrat, straight across the board, and passed all of these laws, began to enforce the laws, created regulations. And at that time, industry was relatively supportive. And so the environmental community uh, moved along and became quite a force. And in fact, Sierra Club was quite small, and some of the other environmental groups didn't exist in 1970. And many of them have their 50th anniversary this year as well. Now, since that day, Kathleen, Earth Day has gone global and evolved into a year-round organization. What's the scope of your work today? Yes, we are uh, international. We are in 190 countries and with tens of thousands of organizations and millions of teachers all involved in our network, faith groups. The list is quite long. And our agenda is both Earth Day, which takes us quite a bit of time, and we have a separate staff that organizes Earth Day worldwide. We come up with a theme. Uh, we begin to reach out to people. Um, we believe people will take the baby steps they need to take to move into the environmental movement through Earth Day. And so that takes up a lot of the time of about 50% of the staff. And then in addition to that, we work on a number of important public policy issues, including plastics, biodiversity, um, a number of issues related to uh, recycling, uh, educate climate and environmental literacy, which is a really big one for us. And we're also engaged in a wide variety of issues that would be, um, you know, obvious to anybody working in the environmental community, including community right to know, uh, building capacity of organizations on the ground worldwide. And we do everything, including put solar on 
on buildings and schools and rural villages around the world. So we have quite a lineup of issues that we work on, mostly because we are a network by definition. And so we respond to our network needs and we're um, pretty versatile. But we do have some core issues, plastics, climate and environmental literacy, biodiversity, and a number of other issues. Climate change, of course, can't forget that, uh, that dominate most of the substantive staff uh, agendas. Now, of course, since 1970, uh, Earth Day has been every April 22nd. Now, all of a sudden, it's a whole new world. Before the coronavirus COVID-19 epidemic hit, what had you planned? Well, we planned a series of things. And, and in that regard, you know, as you can imagine, we, what we intended to do and what we did do and which we're able to maintain is we built the world's largest environmental infrastructure. And by that, I mean, unlike other environmental groups, and you mentioned our mission to begin with, our mission is everybody else. And by that, I mean, and I come from the environmental community, so don't get me wrong, every environmental organization does important work. However, when I came into Earth Day, we decided that our goal was to diversify it, to bring non-environmentalists into the movement, to bring faith-based groups into the movement, right, left, center, um, mayors, high school students, college students, university presidents, and the list of partnerships is enormously long. And so we work with the Sikhs of India and Buddhists, Catholics, um, evangelicals, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, mayors. The list of demographics we are involved with is enormously long. It's over a million groups in total that we do outreach to. And those groups work with us because unlike other environmental groups, we don't try to approach them ourselves directly because it would be futile. There are just too many people in the world. So what we do is we work with their trusted leaders. And so we spend a lot of time working with, discussing and why they should be in the environmental movement and forming partnerships with the leaderships of these hundreds of thousands of groups in order to convince them that taking a step, any step, is better um, than nothing, and taking a step, any step, is good for their communities. And so we've been able to work with many, many groups uh, around the world, and I think that's what makes us different. So for the 50th anniversary, we use that same model and decided we would build an infrastructure that included every single country. And in many countries, we've put together coalitions of groups where there hadn't been before. So we bring together all these diverse parties, sit them down at a table, and we create coalitions. We support their integration of ideas and of each other, and we build strength by building numbers. And so we're quite different in that regard. And so for the 50th, while we are devastated, uh, with what's happened, not just for the 50th, obviously, but because of what's happening to the world, the economy, the deaths. But we are really happy that we built this infrastructure. And our next most important step from a fundraising point of view and from a, a environmental community point of view is that we want to keep it together. And so that's our next step is to keep it together. Among the activities we had planned included uh, strikes, uh, petition drives, but we also had online already many, many digital activities. And I'll tell you about one that's my favorite. Uh, we, about four years ago, I was sitting at a table with someone from the State Department, and we were talking about citizen science and the fact that despite there are millions of scientists around the world, they don't have the information that they need. And we also talked about a parallel issue, which is around the world, belief in science has started to decline. In some countries, it's going up. In some countries, it's steady. But in many, many countries, belief and trust in science was in decline. And so we put those two ideas together, and together with the State Department, the Wilson Center, and literally thousands of partners, we have built and will launch tomorrow the first open source citizen science database in the world that is really amounts to two things. One, aggregation of citizen science from organizations in 192 countries, so you have one-stop shopping. And then the Earth Day part, the 50th anniversary part, is that we built two apps, both of which can be used from your home or in your community and your neighborhood safely. And they're an air and plastics app. 
And when you use the app, you take a photo, you upload it, it goes through some kind of AI process, and then it becomes a useful point of data for not just for scientists, but for governments, for your community. And so we hope by the end of 2020, we'll have built um, a database, an open source database that allows community members, governments, corporations, everybody to see where the hotspots are. In fact, because of the coronavirus, we just had a conversation today about adding health and safety apps to this broad application that we created, which will allow people to see the hotspots, whether it's air pollution or disease or other things, all in one place. And it helps to know if the air and water are dirty and you see asthma all through these applications, then you'll know and the community will know what to do. So that was a digital activity that's about to launch that uh, we hope to have hundreds of millions of people participating in, regardless of where they are and regardless of the coronavirus. Well, and, and it's fantastic. I mean, you, you had to decide to move the whole operation online. Obviously, it's a tough decision, but it's a necessary decision. So, Kathleen, let's talk about or, or give us an idea, if you will, of, of some of the online events that will happen on Earth Day this year. Yeah, and, and you know, we're so lucky because the thing about Earth Day Network is we don't want to own anything. We do obviously own a huge amount of Earth Day. But what's been gratifying is the way the rest of the world um, has gotten together and created their own online activities. And so whether it's Buenos Aires or even in India where they're on unbelievable lockdown, they are moving forward with digital activities, online um, music events, online petition signing, which, of course, that's the way to do it anyway, online voter registration, committing to vote. Uh, we have enormous numbers of plant-based uh chefs that are creating activities for people to learn to cook plant-based foods. And I should, I'm definitely going to log on to some of those. And so we had always been planning these activities in, re, in real time in communities in front of people in addition to the strikes. And now we're able to do a lot of this online. I wish we had another month because we could convert it all online pretty easily. Uh, but right now we have, as you know, about three weeks. So we're doing our best. Uh, to get everybody to convert their activities to online. In addition to that, we're doing something called Digital Earth Day slash Earth Day Live. And so for the 30 hours of Earth Day, because the dateline, Earth Day is longer than 24 hours. And so starting in New Zealand all the way through to Hawaii, we will be um, creating uh, 30 plus hours of Earth Day, which will be continuous um, activities, uh, some of which will be videotaped in advance, some of which will be live. Uh, and we're working with a wide variety of community partners, youth groups, and others to put together terrific content, speeches, music. Um, Pope Francis is, we're hoping, going to be doing a an address for Earth Day in what I think will be 4 a.m. our time, but um, 10 a.m. his in front of uh, St. Peter's Square, because he's been a big supporter of Earth Day. So we're really launching it with all the major partners around the world and influencers and, and incredible people like Pope Francis. So everybody seems to have jumped into the act. Um, and of course, we're encouraging per people uh, to donate and to um, take care of people who are suffering from the coronavirus. So it isn't about that, but it's really about repairing the earth. And I think what's, I think that's the moment in time we're really looking for. It's time to restore the planet. It's time to restore belief in science and trust in science because both with the coronavirus and both with climate change, we've known about this for a while. And in the coronavirus case, which went like wildfire, they still rejected science right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so there's, it's parallel in the sense that climate change is the same way. We've had the science for more than two decades, but we need to be prepared and we need to do something about it. And if there's a moral to this tragic story, it's that it has its parale parallels in other universes, including climate change and nature. It's perhaps difficult to think about it at a time like this, but that sort of suggests, and maybe you can d agree or disagree, but is there opportunity here as well because of, of the coronavirus and the effects and what we've learned from how we now have to operate? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, there's nothing better than community and being with people who share your ideals, your interests, your morals. And that I find 
when I'm out with large groups of environmentalists and non-environmentalists and moms and dads and their kids, we are all the same. We care about our environment, even if it's just our local environment. And so moving us online does have sort of its tragic impacts. But the flip side is there are a lot of people with a lot of time in their, on their hands. And so we're seeing, for example, we just put up a petition called Commit to Vote. And all of a sudden, people are just signing up like wild. I think in part because they're looking at their computers, they're probably flipping between planning for Earth Day and looking at news reports about the virus. Uh, but we are seeing uh, thousands of people come forward. We are up to four or 5,000 volunteers who have turned around and found four or five volunteers in addition to themselves who are all looking for ways to get engaged in the 50th. It's certainly imperfect. Um, and I'm an imperfect environmentalist, but um, as we all go about our business, uh, it's important to engage everybody in this. And I think what's most gratifying is that the people that are doing the most online come from other walks of life. They are not the green greens. They're the palest of greens in the world, but they still want to do something for Earth Day. You know what I think people are going to notice a lot? This was brought up to me recently. I live very close to an airport in Virginia, and there aren't as many planes going out. There certainly aren't Mm -hmm. nearly the number of cars on the road. Just those alone, just those two things alone make a difference in, in the air quality on a daily basis. Absolutely. And whether it's NASA or other private industries, uh, amazing photos online, whether it's in China or India, it doesn't matter where it is. Every single country has uh, created some sort of opportunity to take photos from satellites of their air quality, their water quality, for a bunch of reasons. They're all using satellite photos of their own country. And every single country is experiencing better air quality that's on lockdown. I mean, Mm -hmm. not just a little bit better, but significantly better. And so it's been quite amazing. And there are other gratifying stories. There was a photo in, someone sent me from a major city in India. I think it was Delhi. And I have a photo, if you ever want to look at it. It is uh, photos in this packed place. There's not a soul on the street. There's a photo right down the median, which has grass in it in Delhi. And there were 40 deer lying on the grass. And in my own neighborhood, um, and trust me, they can be quite difficult because they're everywhere, but they're walking down the street. And as we've heard the stories, the dolphins have come back to Venice. They haven't been there in so long and they're swimming everywhere. And across the world, I'm seeing hundreds of photos of people who are taking pictures uh, of wildlife in their yard that they've never seen before. We had, I I live in Bethesda, Maryland, and we are up in the hills. I live near the Potomac, but uh, we've had in the last two days, two or three coyotes in our neighborhood. And while not everybody's fond of them, uh, uh, they seem to be just loping along and minding their own business. And at one point I saw uh, my neighbor's cat kind of in a standoff with the coyote and it simply turned around and walked away. Only I'd had my camera, but I didn't. But I think you're going to see a lot of that. And I think the good news is that people um, are reading about the air and water getting better. And I hope they make that transition from this moment in time with cleaner air, cleaner water, fewer people on the streets, more wildlife. And they move that to their conscious subconsciousness and maybe finally their consciousness that it's time to do something about climate change. And one of our newest campaigns... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I apologize for interrupting. I was just going to say it could be one of those I could have had a V8 type of moments for for all of those yeah. that, that still don't believe that that we are putting a, a, a serious footprint on on this earth. Yeah, and it's it's we all know it. Everybody knows it. We just choose, many of us, to ignore it. It's mm. difficult. As I said before, I'm not a perfect environmentalist. I make a lot of mistakes. I am the best recycler on the planet, but there are other parts <laughs> of my life that are just not great. I admit it, and I'm guilty about it, and I'm an environmentalist hardcore, but I don't – none of us need to – we all need to take the baby steps that we need to take. But the big one is – and this is what we're going to pivot to after Earth Day, which unfortunately may turn out to be entirely digital or at least through the mail, which is voting. It is critically important that we vote our environmental conscience. 
And so we've created something called Vote Earth, and we're teaming up with nonpartisan groups that really care about voting and making it easy to vote because it's our constitutional right. It's the heart and soul of democracy. It's what separates the United States from other despotic and communist and all sorts of other kinds of countries where we actually can exercise the right to vote. We need to make it easy for people to do that, especially now. And so we created about six months ago and have been running it around the world, this concept called Vote Earth, which is, again, nonpartisan. It's just hoping people will become educated on the issues and vote what they know is right in order to protect the planet themselves, their health, their kids, and that very far away thing, future generations. But I do think uh, people are moving in that direction and we'll see the outcome over the next um, three to five years. And so if at that point we're still not voting, we're voting entirely with our pocketbook rather than um, the fate of the planet, I guess we'll just all have to work harder. Mm, yeah. Hey, real quick, before you go, Earth Day, obviously not the only activist group having to adjust. How are you seeing other advocacy and adv- activist groups adjusting to this new normal? You know, that's a great question, and I'm on tons of listservs, and it's been really rewarding. First, a lot of groups are just doing their own Earth Day, which is, is great. They're revving up their members, and they're raising money, and they're uh, going about their business Obviously, uh, the court system isn't entirely stopped. So a lot of my friends, and I'm a lawyer, so I used to be very engaged in litigation, and it, uh, and I'm I'm gratified to see a lot of that go on as we see so many of our laws under you know under the cloud of coronavirus, we're seeing so many of our laws just being decimated uh, under the cover of coronavirus. It's kind of shocking, really. If I could be shocked, it's it's hard to believe, but. It's, so that kind of thing, and, and I'm really thankful for the organizations, um, particularly you know the big uh, groups that have many, many great lawyers like uh, Earth Justice and others that continue to file lawsuits, continue to protect us. And then there are other organizations that are planning online activities that are very different than Earth Days, but they're still intended to keep their members and others really engaged in watching the progress or lack of progress on everything from climate change to what are the next big things that are coming down the road that will need votes, that will need litigation, that will need community action. And so I'm gratified that if nothing else, people um, are continuing the fight, especially around the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. It's a great reminder of why we're doing this. Absolutely. Kathleen Rogers, president of Earth Day Network. If you want to find out some more and you want to get involved a little bit more, go to earthday.org. You can find out all the information you need. Kathleen, thank you so much for your time with us today. Wishing you the best. And we look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. You as well. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Should networks stop airing Trump's coronavirus briefings? Bill Press talks with veteran journalist Soledad O'Brien. I just ended up watching about 45 minutes of Donald Trump's latest briefing from the White House, and it was the same old stuff about how great we're doing and the vaccine's on its way and the new medication's on its way and the hospital ship is on its way. And we're doing more than any other country on the planet, he says. Should we, should, and this, of course, is on all the cable channels, should they even be televising these daily press briefings? Listen, at the end of the day, um, I think journalists and journalism should be about serving the public, right? I think whenever you're confused or trying to figure out what the right thing to do is, you go back to, well, what's our mission? What what are we here for? And the mission of journalism is to serve the public. And I think everyone would say these press conferences are full of untruths, of lies, of 
exaggerations, of mischaracterizations, right? They're, literally, everyone has to be followed by a here's a fact check of what the president just said, and all of these things are untrue. And so I think it's become quite clear that no, of course not. We shouldn't be covering them live. If you have some desire to do, you know, if you feel like, hey, the world or our viewers need to see this, then you can always, you know, run it and and literally spend your time fact checking it first. So you're running in real time with actual accurate information versus giving somebody a platform to spew lies. I think every journalist would agree it is not okay to give someone a platform to spew lies. And, and so, it, it, but here's what they're balancing. The balancing, it's a ratings getter and the ratings yep. have not been better. And so, you know, that's, that's the real problem. The real issue is nothing other than the ratings have not been better. That's it. Yeah. And, and there is no after the press briefing, right? They just go back to their regular news. I mean, there is no point by point refutation of the lies that Donald Trump has told. Like, you know, this vaccine. He- well, and it doesn't correct. And it doesn't even. Um, so everyone will talk very hand wringingly around, like, oh my gosh, it, it leads the next day of stories. But yet they don't actually, in real time, work to to fix and fix the problem that they're giving a platform to. Right. So, you know, one has to say, well, why does someone do that? And are they crazy? Do they not understand? It's been going on a long time. So clearly not crazy. They do fully understand. They like the ratings, period, full stop. And they're willing to put bullshit on TV if the ratings are good, period, full right. stop. This to me I don't know about you, reminds me of the 2016 campaign where Donald Trump's rallies, CNN covered, her good network, covered every one of those rallies from start to finish, right? Every Donald Trump rally with all that bullshit. And no other candidate could even get any airtime at all, right? And now they're now they're giving yeah, Donald so Trump the, the same, same platform. Right. And, and so people say, will the media learn? It's you have to want to learn a lesson. And the lesson was we made a ton of money off of Donald Trump. So there's no there's no thing to learn. In fact, the more fighting you're in, the more of a debate. I mean, reporters often post when Donald Trump has said something nasty to them, right? Because they feel like, oh, it's a it's not a bad thing. It's a kind of a little bit of a uh, badge of, of right. honor to right. some degree. So I don't think there's a lesson to be learned if you've made a ton of money out of pitching Donald Trump like you're doing an entertainment show, which is your biggest, craziest, over-the-top ratings getter, gets front and center all the time. And even if you have to put your camera on an empty mic stand, that is better than something else. So the other day, uh, you know, Donald Trump does this pivot after totally dismissing this, saying there was only five cases, it was going to be down to one case, this was a nothing burger, the whole thing. He suddenly came out and said, oh, I'm going to declare a national emergency. I happened to be there in the Rose Garden when he said that. And immediately, right, some people in the media said, oh, my God, this is what we've been waiting for. This is the true leader. Here's our friend. I'd love to get your response to Dana Bash on CNN. This was remarkable from the president of the United States. This is a nonpartisan. This is um, an important thing to note uh, and to applaud from an American standpoint, from, an, from a human standpoint. He is um, being the kind of leader that people need, at least in tone, today and yesterday, in tone that people need and want and yearn for in times of crisis and uncertainty. The kind of leader we want Soledad, <laughs> talk about a pivot, right? I think that we've seen this over and over again. And this time it's Dana Bash who's it, right? Which is everybody is hoping and pining away for a president to behave in a presidential way, which Donald Trump has never done historically, will never do. And it's just interesting to see the leeway that certain people give to certain people. Right. That, that every day. I mean, I think it was Van Jones who at some point when the president was able to read off of a teleprompter without tripping over his <laughs> teeth, he said, you know, today is the moment that he became president. Right. They're looking to declare. Also, let's keep in mind, you have a l- absolute ton of time to fill when you're on live TV. Right. I, I feel badly for Dana because this was so terrible. She got raked over the coals, I think rightfully so, because her 
what the media gets so confused, and I think she's a really good example of someone who doesn't, so how someone comes across for the moment is such a ridiculously lay measure of what they do in their character, especially during a pandemic, but I would argue at any time. So this concept of today he delivered words in a tone, let's all agree, tone alone, she even couches it, his tone was what the American people need, what people are looking for. And she went on to say something like, we should applaud that. And I just, I was so disgusted for a number of reasons. One, it's like Lucy and Charlie Brown, right? Every single time this person proves to you. And within, I think, 12 or 30, 24 hours, the president was back to tweeting disgusting things and mocking, I believe, Mitt Romney, who had got into um, uh, self-isolation. His wife, of course, is ill and wanted to make sure that he hadn't been exposed to COVID-19. So there was just no indication at all that, in fact, the president's tone symbolized anything other than him able to read something without messing it up. I, I just don't know... I, I think that it's such an interesting psychological experiment of like, why would you want to believe that person could do it? Why does he get time after time after time today in the Wall Street Journal? Um, there's a journalist who writes about if the president can rise above the pettiness yeah. and if the president can, you're like, he is the pettiness. As if, I just right? don't, I As don't, if he were capable of doing that. And it's just time and time again. And it's not like, hey, listen, we're three months into his presidency. This has been the same way for three years. But also the history of Donald Trump himself as president of the United States. But even before he was president, this is what he did. Right. So I, I find it all very uh, perplexing because Dana Bash is a smart lady. She's not an idiot. Um, but what she said was idiotic. And I think she was rightfully raked over the coals for it. Uh, and and often I see um, journalists get up there and say these things and pronouncements about what they hope and want him to be. That it's just it's there's no evidence, and yet he gets um, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to say something, and no one seems to look back at his history and point out that wow, this seems to go against everything else he's done for the last three years. Right. Now this is also the very same time, and again I was there when. Um you meet Chow Cinder, ask him and said, well, you, uh, you know, you shut down this office uh, for pandemic, how to respond. And do you take any responsibility? And that's where Trump famously said, I don't take any responsibility at all. Right. I didn't do it. And at which point before she could follow up, and we've never seen this happen before, they shut off our mic. They turned off our mic and they did that yeah. several times at that news conference in the Rose Garden where they would not allow a follow up question again. And the mm-hmm. media just rolled over. And so you over. would think that, right, and you would think that that for Dana, that actually might be an interesting thing to point out. So even if the president suddenly changed his tone, you would say, wow, but this other thing that's happened at this very same news conference, and by the way, even within that news conference or that press conference, he he, he, he talked about the Chinese virus. He yep. was, I mean, he, he had a lot of crazy. So even in the whatever it was, one hour that you guys were all there, it wasn't like it was the most sane, different tone. It was for a moment, it sounded like he was trying to deliver a message. And he stayed on message for 35 (laughs) seconds or whatever the amount of time was. So, you know, yes, you would think that the press would actually stick up for each other and and, and follow up on that. And, And Dana would, or others, right, would sort of point that out. But they don't. And again, it's because... This idea that anybody's learned a lesson, there's no lesson to be learned. It's how much money did you make, period. When you look at, so this is the latest um, uh, latest episode, if you will, or latest uh, whatever, t- turning the page of the Trump presidency. But as you point out, this has been going on for a long time. So the Washington Post, which keeps track of this, I think the latest number I saw, 16,241 lies told by Donald Trump that they've been able to track. And that's those are things that they'll call lies, right? Because there's a whole other range of things that are like exaggerations, <laughs> right. not quite a lie. You'd really have to believe that he was being dishonest and maybe he didn't know. You know, so they don't they don't necessarily dip into those things that we might colloquially call a lie, but that technically aren't lies. Right. So the question is, what do we do about that? What should the media do about that? Point out everyone? I think people pat themselves on the back. Yes, absolutely. I think Daniel Dale is doing a great job tracking them. 
I don't think it's anywhere near enough to track them, right? I mean, as if somehow just tracking lies from the president is is enough. I, I think it's it's amazing to me that you track lies from the president, but you continue to book um, spokespeople, right? That that they can literally lie to you. When when I used to do a show. Uh, at CNN, actually, and even when I was at NBC, if someone lied to you, like literally overtly lied to you, like Kellyanne Conway lies all the time when she's on the air, you just wouldn't put them on TV. At some point, your right. your sense of self-respect would be like, you know, I, I can't have you on if you're just going to bullshit me. It just doesn't work. You know, I, I, I understand spin. I understand dodging. But at some point, I'm going to give you a platform. I'm going to push you hard. But you have to have a semblance of honesty. And I think what's happened is the media has really been so interested in having that kind of like craziness and debate that it's worth it to put people on, even if they're lying to the audience. And as we all know, when a lie is is given a platform, even if someone comes on afterwards to say, hey, I want to point out that that thing was untrue, you know, it's already gotten out there. It's been propagated and it's been chopped up and it'll live on social media. And so you don't, you can't just kill a lie by saying, hey, that thing that you saw five minutes ago or 10 mm-hmm. minutes ago or two hours ago, that was a lie. It's, it's great to track it, but really to what end? No. And with Kellyanne Conway, CNN at one time said, we're not going to book her anymore. And then they started booking they her They book again, her all the time. Right? There was a time when she, yeah. I remember, oh, uh, what, who was it? It was um, somebody else on CNN who, who actually was being paid by CNN who talked about how he didn't feel like he had to be honest when talking to the press. And the next day they had booked him on the air. So I think that what's happened is people understand journalism has become a game. It's become a game. It's just a game, right? And And nobody wants to call out racism. Nobody... Nobody wants to say this is racist and you're giving a plan. I, I, you know, uh, every single time I retweet anything from the first lady, I'm like, she's a birther. And no one, CNN did an entire documentary on her, not talking about her birtherism, which, by the way, was on camera. She said it out loud on, on the set. It's just insane. But, you know, that's where we are. So it's a very disappointing time, I think, for, for, for me, certainly, and I think for lots of journalists. How do how do we deal with Donald Trump's tweets, or how should we? I mean, what 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 drives me crazy is I see so often on social media people just repeat the tweets, yeah. which are just again pure bullshit, right? And and pay so much attention to them. Should we just ignore them? Should we not report them? I mean, yeah, you, you know, know, they I, are I, coming from the president of the United States. I think kind of hard to ignore. Twitter has decided to, you know, you again. I think you can report things without giving them life, right? I mean, one of the things when we would do stories on white supremacists, you know, you don't have to give someone a live mic and a platform all the time. You can you can talk about what they've done and give it context. So in the middle of that discussion, you've got context as opposed to, hey, we let them talk for five minutes. Now I'm going to jump in and tell you what they said was wrong. So I, I think mm-hmm. I would handle the president's tweets the exact same way. This is something, he's a president of the United States. Obviously, we have to cover his tweets, but this idea that you have to elevate every single thing. I mean, entire shows are blown out every day, right? They start now with, good morning, everybody. The president tweeted last night, or the president's been tweeting this morning, and and they they give him the platform. And again, if it didn't rate well, if he wasn't a big draw in a lot of ways, right? If he wasn't over the top and crazy, and everybody has learned in reality TV, the one who grabs the weave and, and gets drunk and goes nuts, well, she's the one who's going to get paid the most money. So they've really learned this idea of like, that's going to be the crazy over the top compelling one. And there's not serving the public. Sometimes news can be a little bit boring because you got to just cover the important Mm -hmm. policy issues and agendas. It's really about how do we, how do we get something to be salacious over the top and crazy? And I think that's the biggest problem is that the media is really trying to sell something uh, and not really serve the public. I think it's pretty simple. Is anybody out there doing a good job covering Donald Trump, do you believe? Yeah, I think a lot of people. I mean, I, I often rag on the New York Times, but I think a lot of their work is actually sometimes very good. Um, I think I think CNN, sometimes their work is really, really good. I, I think the problem is that, that uh, in leadership is probably the biggest issue. Um, you know, there's no they, – they, they can't say, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to take these pressers. There's no reason to take the press conference he did today. There was no reason to take that. You could run it 30 minutes later, right? I mean, it didn't – it has – it's going to be inaccurate. If you really were trying to serve the public, you just hold it. You do a, you know, a, a, a fact check on it. 
And then you'd actually disseminate mm-hmm. and you'd also wouldn't cut away when the scientists come on. I think one of the most obvious things about uh, all of this is when the scientists come on off. I mean, MSNBC sometimes will cut away from the scientists. <laughs> you're like, you're supposed to be informing the public. So, you know, it's a bit of a game now. How do you, um, I, I follow, I'm one of your 1.1 million followers <laughs> on Twitter. So I know who some of your uh, favorite targets are. Um what do you think happened to Joe and Mika? Uh, I Who think that one time. I think that Joe was very solicitous of President Trump early on when he thought he could get in on the administration in some capacity, would be my guess. And I have no inside information on this. And I think the minute it became clear that he was, I mean, if you go and check the record, the minute the president uh, announced Pence as his running mate, um, Joe got very cold on him. So, you know, I think he, I think a lot of people actually really saw their fortunes potentially tied to Trump, especially if they knew him well socially, right? It seemed like, hey, I could have an in. And you saw a lot of people have gone through the White House because they thought that they could kind of get something out of, you know, milking their relationship into something that would be useful for them. And uh, Chuck Todd on Meet the Press, not one of your favorites, huh? You know, partly because Meet the Press was one of my favorite shows ever. I mean, when Tim Russert did that show, he literally was like a god at at NBC. And I'm not overstating it. I mean, he was worshipped. And I think he was able to figure out how do you hold very powerful people accountable when you're a powerful person and you're invited to their cocktail parties, right? And yet when they came on his show, he very much was like, this is my show and there will be no bullshit on this show. And, you know, occasionally I think there were moments when he failed, when Eiffel pointed out a couple of times. But I think ultimately people had tremendous respect. Like if you're going to go on his show, you have to bring it. What happens, I think, with Chuck Todd is that his line of questioning sometimes really fails. And I think he he is really afraid of following up and being really strong with people. I think he's afraid of his guest, actually. Uh, Chris Wallace at Fox News. I mean, he really is a pretty good master class and he's just not afraid of his guests at all. He just, he literally allows no bullshit on his show. And you get the sense, like if you're going to come on his show, you best not lie to Chris Wallace. Most of the time he really holds people accountable and he's personally offended if they try to bullshit him. And I think that Chuck has made it clear in other interviews. One, he described himself as being naive. Two, he has said um, that he, you know, he doesn't think it's his job to correct people's lies. I, I, I don't know that. I mean, I guess I just don't see eye to eye with that. I don't, I, I do think it's your job. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's made the show less good, certainly. And I think it's made the show less reliable for information. And then I think just structurally, the arc of an interview often, you know, he's just afraid to go for the jugular and ask the person the tough question, then you can kind of see that on the air. So it's disappointing, because, you know, I think that I'm just one of a zillion people who really wish that Tim Russert uh, was doing that show at this very important time. Bill Press talking with Soledad O'Brien. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressPods.com. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Jennifer Steinauer, Kathleen Rogers, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.